everybody. Welcome to the next uh, Sprint demo session of the TOS station. Um, it feels like Sprint 35. Uh, we are a little bit late, but that really doesn't matter in the time of internet and YouTube. You're going to watch it all on YouTube. Um, we've prepared a few um, sessions. Um, in general, I will uh, try to convert the show notes that we have in a Red Hat internal Google document right now into a markdown uh, thing, maybe a file or maybe a directory and a file on our GitHub repository so people can read up what we did before. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, my Argos CD stuff, if you don't mind. But let me see if I can share my screen. I don't know why. Maybe I'm missing some CPU cycles, but my uh, blue jeans is extremely slow today. So um, bear with me. Whenever I stop talking, there's something missing on my screen. Well, everybody should be able to see my um, screen now. There's an Argo or web user interface uh, that you're seeing. It's uh, basically showing a little bit of. Um, the stuff that I worked on. Um, so Hashart is working on the CI part, and I've been um, asking the AI ops people, hey, um, uh, what do we want to use? It feels like we are going to use Argo CD, but we don't have any uh, strong opinion on that one. And that is why I um, wanted to, to get a little bit clearer view on a few questions. For example, how to manage secrets in an Argo CD environment. Right now, we have all our secrets in Ansible vaults and the Ansible playbooks um, use these secrets to create OpenShift secrets. Um, is it still the same uh, for Argo? Or how do we uh, manage uh, configuration files like uh, config maps or other things in Argo? Um, in general, um, I have put everything on the GitHub uh, repository. So there's a new repository called uh, Toth-Application. You're going to find all the stuff in there. And um, the structure that I've been following, that is also up to discussion, is that we have a main application in, in the master branch of that repository. Oh, maybe I go there. Uh -huh. so, slow today. So let's go over there. Um, so the general um, structure that I've been following right now is that we have in the uh, master branch of that repository um, a few components that reflect the TOS uh, components. Uh, there's, for example, advisor or the graph sync job. Um, there's an init job and the update, uh, the package update uh, thing. Um, I think that is required because we are going to deploy for example, the graph sync job into multiple namespaces. Uh, Argo in general is able to deploy one Argo application to one OpenShift project. And uh, specifically, the graph sync job um, and the result API live in multiple namespaces. If you look at our architectural diagram, um, they live at least in two, if not three namespaces. Um, because the back end is generating stuff, the middle tier is generating stuff, and both namespaces are, and our moon is also generating stuff. Uh, all these uh, three namespaces need to talk to the result API, and all these three namespaces generate data that needs to be synced. Now, our current architecture um, requires three deployments of the sync, graph sync job and three deployments of the result API. Um, to enable Argo to do so, I forked these, or I separated these Argo applications into subdirectories. If you have a look here, this is what the README states. So this is actually a separate Argo CD application. And same for the advisor, this is a separate Argo CD application. To reflect the different environments, uh, we deploy to, I have created branches in this repository. So if you switch over to the test branch, you're going to see that things change. A browser would be fast enough. They would change faster. You see that the directory just, or the repository just contains uh, something that is called overlays for the test environment. 
that is uh, special stuff from uh, customize. Customize is used uh, in the back end of Argo to generate all the OpenShift manifests and to deploy them. And this overlay is applied on top of the master branch. Um, so if you go into uh, this one, you see all the customizations that should be applied to the test environment. Therefore, they live in the test branch of the Git repository. And all these customizations are applied by the tool called Customize by Argo CD. So, for example, if you have a look at the config maps, you will see that these is the set of configurations that are valid for the, um, for the test environment. If we're going to switch back to the master branch and um, have a look at the core directory that is called core for historical reasons, by the way. <laughs> we have also configuration maps, but this is a different set of things uh, that will be applied to the configuration maps. So both files are combined by uh, Customize, by uh, Argo CD, and the resulting uh, set of manifests will be deployed to OpenShift then. So that's how it looks like in the uh, Git repositories. Um, how it looks like on Argo it can be seen here. Um, for example, if you look at the application that is deployed from the core repository, you see that, for example, here I used my branch of the application. Uh, sorry, I used my fork of the application. I used the test branch and told it to use everything that is coming in from the test overlay. Again, go back and back. Here is not test. Here is the test branch and the test overlay directory. And uh, customize going to look at this file, customization.yaml. And it will include everything into the generation of uh, artifacts or manifests that is stated in this file. For example, it will include everything from the core application. Then it will apply all the OpenShift, uh, sorry, all the Postgres stuff. Then it will um, install an Argo uh, deployment. It will create routes for Argo user interface. And it will mesh in or uh, uh, patch merge in the configuration files, the image stream, and the uh, init job from the overlay test directory in the test branch. That is what I said here. Please use the test branch. Please use the overlay test directory. After Customize has generated all these manifests, Argo will simply deploy them. That is what you see here, a set of deployed artifacts. Um, you have watched closely, you have seen that I also deployed Argo in a namespace uh, variant, and I also have deployed OpenShift, uh, sorry, again, I have also deployed Postgres. Uh, here's Postgres with all that stuff. The reason behind that is that I really want to have a standalone test environment, right? You don't have to depend on external Postgres or external um, Argo or external Kafka or something like that. Whenever you install from the test branch into a test environment, you should be able to run TOS um, without any uh, dependencies. Um, if we have a look at the um, if we have a look at the OpenShift project itself, you will see in a short moment that. We have a lot. It's really slow. We go to the project that I use. You see that um, all these uh, things have been deployed by Argo. The few solvers um, have been created by the init job. The init job um, has actually run. Um, the uh, Argo server has been deployed, Open, uh, Postgres has been deployed, the result API has been deployed. So this seems to be a pretty straightforward way of uh, declaring what we want to do 
and having Argo CD deploy all that stuff. Um, the nice thing is that we don't have to use Argo CD for that. Um, Argo CD is just a tool that is handling um, some different methods to create the manifest. The method that we use and that we depend on is uh, customize. So we could also go ahead and uh, create the same environment here on OpenShift with all these uh, things deployed from this directory and the customize command line tool. So you could do something like customize build from this branch, from this directory, and pipe that through an OCI apply, and the same environment will be created. Yes, that's it for the time being. Any any questions to all that stuff? I mean, there will be plenty of questions. I have not answered all my own questions, but do you have any questions right here, right now? Good. Overwhelming clearness delivered. So, uh, how about reverting right. changes? Or if I deploy something that I want to revert, something that doesn't work? Um, I actually haven't done that. So um, Argo CD itself has a history and rollback mechanism. I, I never did that. I have played around with uh, forward porting of uh, things. So whenever I did something in my test branch and I was happy with it, I um, basically use uh, git cherry pick to bring these changes into the master branch. And I remove them from the test branch, but this is still uh, commits that move forward in history. Moving backward in history, I didn't do using Argo. Is this going to replace option to skip a commit? Say it again, uh, Marek. Is there an option to skip a commit? I mean, not to deploy it? No, of course not. Um, Argo CD is going to deploy whenever you say um, sync, whenever you say please commit, uh, please deploy. Um, so you can have five commits in a row and don't sync the application to OpenShift. But whatever is in Git uh, will be deployed. It's the current state um, of a of a Git reference. So it might be a branch, it might be a tag, it might be a specific commit. Are you heading towards a specific use case? Um, yeah, I mean like, um, for example, changing just two lines in the readme and I don't want to redeploy the whole application. Okay, if you if you change the README, then the README will not be part of the um, customize um, workflow because the README is not um, used as an input in the customize generation, and therefore the uh, application has not changed from a customize slash Argo CD point of view. Therefore, it will not be redeployed. But I see what you're saying. So if I play around and and figure out. This is not good. And um, uh, if you if you create like 15 commits and you push okay. each commit, every commit will be deployed actually, unless you push fast maybe. enough. Then maybe, yeah, maybe uh, some will is, be. Uh, yeah, readme is um, not a good example, but it can be comments in the manifests, for example. Yes. If they result in effective changes after the customized build, they will be synced to the OpenShift cluster. But again, you, you have the power to not push these commits. Good. So, Sai, did you no, have I a question? Just, I just lost you. If you ask anything, uh, please, can you say that again? Oh, yes. Um, so I said, um, whatever um, whatever uh, changes result from a customized build, um, these changes will be synchronized to the OpenShift cluster. Um, if you're just uh, doing like like uh, typo fixing or stuff like that, um, you don't need to push that uh, to the Git repository to the upstream repository. So it will not result in a in a in a um, 
deployment by Argo CD. Um, or you could uh, also change your strategy, for example, for a production deployment and uh, don't reference the master branch, but reference tags in the Git repository so that uh, stuff will just be deployed um, if you push to a specific tag. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, sometimes people have like a develop branch and like they keep pushing new changes there and then finally merge it to master. But I was That's asking, right. is, this is this replacing our thought ops, like part of our thought ops operations or like, is this like a new way to do it? Uh, yes, uh, hopefully. Uh, okay. Because uh, this way we can use uh, one tool that A, can deploy to internal and external um, environments in an automated way. So right now I'm I'm running on a quick lab cluster. I'm deploying to a quick lab cluster, but I could also deploy to PSI. I could also deploy to the mass open cloud. So whatever ta cluster is reachable by Argo can be used for deployment. And um, it could be easily automated. So imagine that a Tekton pipeline that has just created a few new images is triggering a test deployment. So the deployment will be done by Argo. The build stuff will be done by Tekton. All right. And maybe it gets easier. I, I mean, all the Ansible playbooks are not bad. We're, we're having a lot of fun with it. But maybe it's get, getting easier this way. Uh, did you have any issues while doing this? No. It was nice yeah. and easy. <laughs> so, um, so one of the main questions um, I had uh, was, uh, how do I manage uh, secrets, right? So right now we have a super secret uh, Ansible Vault password that a few people know that could be used to decrypt the Ansible vault and we put the correct secrets in into the OpenShift secrets. Um, how do we do that with um, Argo? Uh, there needs to be built a an, an, uh, customized extension. Uh, that customized extension requires a rebuild of customize itself. Sorry, it's called a plugin, a customized plugin. Um, that um, new customize, including the plugin, needs to be deployed to an Argo CD container image, and that needs to be run by by the Argo CD server. So it's a little bit trickier than just putting some stuff in the Ansible vault and uh, decrypt it. Um, I need to have a key management system for that. So in the background, Customize and its plugin is talking to Google uh, KMS, Google Key Management System, and is asking for the decryption keys and stuff like that. Obviously, I need to have a service account and uh, um, corresponding secret so that the Argo CD is allowed to talk to Google Key Management Service and uh, has the right credential to ask for the decryption keys. So stuff is a little bit more complicated. Um, but if that infrastructure is set up, um, it's pretty easy to encrypt the secrets. It's, it's, it's just one command line. And after that, the secrets are encrypted and stored in Git. Uh, that's kind of easy. Uh, that was one hassle. The, the other one was um, that sometimes it feels like Argo is losing its brain. So sometimes the only option to get in an operational state was to delete the Argo CD application and recreate it. Deletion is kind of tricky because um, either you tell Argo to delete the application from the Argo um, scope, or you tell Argo to delete it from the Argo scope and the OpenShift scope so that real OpenShift objects get deleted. Sometimes Argo is losing its brain and it forgets about what's up in OpenShift and what's up in Argo. So it takes maybe two hours, I don't know why, for Argo itself to delete the application. That feels like nah, kind of not good, but let's see. Cool. So. 
a chart. Want to keep on going with the um, tecton stuff? Yeah. Oh, um, by the way, people, um, have a look at the repository. I think I dropped it in the uh, Hangouts channel whenever I have something that I want comments on. Um, feel free to read uh, through it and, and send pull requests or open issues with questions or chat about it, right? It's not that, um, <laughs> as always, I, I, I'm not uh, owning the truth here and I don't know everything. So please feedback. Hashad, maybe now, up to you. Uh, and yeah, Tecton. Uh, yeah. Cool. Sure. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. We can see. Positive. Uh, so we, we are working on Tecton C, uh, Tecton, like based on Tecton, we are building uh, .ci. Uh, so what we do here is we, we are trying to test uh, PRs and then create an image out of them. Uh, uh, so that is source ops repository just for testing right now. I just wanted to show what things we can do with Tecton. Uh, so as a user for .ci, what people can do is have their protected branches where they want to merge and they can have rules on that. So there is .ci koala test, pytest. Uh, if you want everything from .ci to run, you don't need to check anything. But if you just want a few of the things, you can do an easy check on, okay, I just want Koala check or PyTest, test, and you can do that. Uh, rest of the things will handle. Uh, you can save the changes. And, and now you should have them. Uh, if you, uh, oh, one more thing, Martin, the main thing which you need to add to your, uh, to your repository is a webhook. Uh, we have already added dots CI AICOE ultra hook. This is the extent this is the instance which we are running right now. So if you add that uh Tecton can serve. Uh, so let me check it on one of my PRs. So I have this PR. If I create this, what happens in the background is the pipeline starts running, and you see there are checks running here. Uh, sorry, I can handle and so these two uh, checks would be running from dot ci. Uh, so here would be a bunch of pods running. There's a Koala test running, it's checking the issues, PyTest. So uh, at the background, in the background, is these are the checks which are running. It opens a command, thanks for opening the pull request. And once the checks are completed, you see dot ci check is completed. So uh, once all the checks completes, it creates a p. It creates an image out of them, and and as of now, I to show you there would be an image created like for test source of 187. There would be a, a image created, and then if you have provided your credentials for your query repository, then it can raise a uh, image uh, to your query. It can push an uh, image to your query repository. So the uh, goal here is to for each PR uh, to create an image so that you can test out in any of the instance of uh, whatever you work you have done. And uh, if you want to deploy it in, into your cluster, you, know, you can use the Tecton CD or you can deploy it on your own. Uh, I just wanted to show you this uh, completes, but, uh, but yeah, that was what I had that each checks can be done and you can raise up, uh, you can create a image out of them and use them. Uh, this is the work which is right now here present in .ci extension. What we are trying to do is uh, to handle the request to push to query. We need credential to push to the query repository. We need to handle that. Uh, apart from that, on each merge, we need to release uh, how to release it. We can right now, what we can do is generate the image directly and push it to query. Uh, or else we can create certain kind of uh, pipeline where you create an issue and it will, based upon the issue, it will create an image for you and tag it, tag it to the new uh, version tag which you have in your repository. As of now, we have deployed this on user API and of .station and we can test that out. So that's what I had.
let me know if you have any suggestions how to improve this and that would be very helpful or any ideas which how you would like to have it so, so that's why i wanted to demo it or to show it what we had right now nice so um we have one tecton pipeline there uh, per github event type right so if yeah. if i open up a pull request that is hitting the pull request pipeline if I open up an issue that is or that might hit the issue pipeline, correct? Yes. Uh so okay. we yeah, we are also gonna do this for check runs. Uh but right now there is no feature to respond back. So we would have to either do it with uh any additional GitHub GitHub application. So we might be using stuff GitHub, but yeah, that's the Okay, cool. Um, and from from personal feeling, uh, Tecton is something everybody should, in a in a very silent minute, should wrap around uh, his head, because we have pipelines. We have uh, that consists of tasks. We have cluster tasks. We have pipeline runs. We have uh, trigger events. We have trigger event listeners and trigger bindings. So um, it's not. From my point of view, it's not as straightforward as in Zool, where I had that one file and I simply say um, on on the check pipeline, which is executed on every pull request, I want to run PyTest and Py and Koala. It, it is it feels more complicated, but I really don't have a feeling of uh, about, I, don't, I really don't have a feeling about what the developer will really see from all these pipelines or if that is something that we negotiate once or, or we negotiate once and simply implement and nobody will ever see it again i i don't know um so i think one thing that i missed was like on the checks when you there is a detail button if you click on that normally in koala you would take uh like sorry in zool you used to take it to the manifest a page where you had all the runs so exactly like this will be taken to tech on dashboard where the runs where the check runs are running and you can see the logs based upon that uh, you can see what was the issue or anything like that yeah thanks cool any other questions good what's next on the list Modaka, Francesco, you're still typing. Is it you or is it uh, Frido? Uh, sorry, it was me. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good. So go ahead. Thank you. So let me share the screen. I'm not going to be too long. Um, let's see. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, no. now. Okay, yes. So, as, uh, so the topic is uh, basically, you know, um, regarding the unsold Python packages. Uh, what I refer to is that uh, we have the Kebeshet app, the GitHub app that is uh, uh, up and running, and uh, we are providing advices to the user uh, on their software stacks. And now we want to be able to uh, improve this uh, user experience. And in order to do that, we basically uh, start to analyze this uh, uh, software stack. So last time we showed that uh, we have a notebook that is able to analyze these advices and uh, we can uh, basically uh, see what is uh, the advice that we are providing and if some of them needs to be improved. And in particular, there is a specific uh, case, which is the case of the unsolved packages. So in, in when uh, advisor does not uh, uh, know about some specific packages which are not yet uh, solved inside the, uh, the and, and they are not stored in the in the database basically we are not able to provide uh, uh, an advice in that case we want to have a pipeline that is able to uh, make sure that uh, we can provide the, this result uh, to the user and so what we did first of all is to automate this uh, process of uh, collecting these uh, advices so as i showed last time we are we push those metrics those, uh, sorry, so those analysis of the advices uh, reports created. 
and we are able to see them uh, in uh, Grafana after pushing them to Prometheus, and we can see the different type of uh, advices. And uh, what I'm referring to at the moment is the one that, the, that is related to the unsolved uh, dependencies. So in that case, basically advisor, or let's say we want to know which uh, packages are not yet solved, and we want to schedule solver. So we want to analyze those packages, and then we want to go back uh, to the user providing the advice on the software stack. So as you, um, so this was the previous implementation that we have of uh, Kebeshet, uh with the two uh, workflows. So the, the first workflow is checking basically the, the inputs of the user, if they are uh, correct. And the second one is actually doing the advice. And in that case, in the case of the specific advice, if the if we if the user uh, sorry if the software stack contained some packages which are unsolved, then we want to do something about it. And so we started to uh, create a new type of uh, architecture uh, for the Kebeshet Hub. So as you can see now, uh, we want to handle the type of advice. And this specific case, we have uh, that advisor uh, in the logs is going to show, um, sorry, in the report, is going to show the, the packages that are unsolved. When, for example, if uh, we assume a black has not been solved, so then we want to be able to know which um, version of these packages are, are not yet known by Tot and they are not solved. So in this case, we reuse uh, one of the services that we, get, that we already have, which is package release job. So it's going to check on... Uh, if there are new uh, version available of this package and uh, is going to create the uh, correct uh, records in the database in order to uh, make uh, Tot uh, aware of those packages. And once these packages are uh, basically, these new records have been created in the database, we plan to have uh, um, an, an app, that, uh, sorry, another task in the workflow which is able to check for these packages and uh, through Kafka, send some messages regarding those packages. So there will be a producer, which is included in the workflow that is gonna send these messages regarding to the packages. And there will be a consumer of these packages that is uh, basically going to trigger a uh, solver, as you can see here. So once package release job identifies those packages, uh, the producer is gonna send messages regarding these packages and then a consumer will basically schedule the solver. Uh, so the second step is to modify the solver workflow. So the solver is gonna have also an, an extra task that is gonna consider the, the solver, the solved packages as priority basically, which means that uh, they are going to be used for uh, an advice that we want to provide as fast as possible to the user. And in this way, we have another producer basically that uh, send messages to Kafka saying, uh, I finished this, uh, I finished to solve this package. And there will be a consumer that uh, is basically handling uh, the case of the, of these packages. And in particular, is gonna uh, check in the database for uh, information regarding uh, advisor run that has unsolved packages and is gonna iteratively check on this package on these uh, uh, records in order to verify that uh, when uh, those packages uh, are solved we can reschedule advisor automatically so we don't need to do <clears throat> that uh, manually and in that way the pipeline will uh, continue as it was before basically so we go back and uh, we are able to provide uh, the advice and this will show the results basically in the check run on the on github um that's it is our ongoing work uh, until now there are there have been package release job has been already modified uh thanks uh, frido and uh, we are working on the producer and consumer for the solver and modifying the solver so there is still some work to do but uh, that's uh, the idea behind this uh, modification of the of the app and that's it thank you if you have question No question, uh, but a comment. Um, yes. So, so uh, 
we have introduced Kafka as a new component here, right? So, so Kevin did that uh, before with the yes. package uh, update job. Uh, you, you are also using Kafka. I think, uh, A, um, it is uh, state of the art to have these kind of messaging components to, to have these asynchronous operations. And B, um, it gives us, um, an, really in the, the opportunity to, to learn stuff easily, right? We don't have to create uh, config maps. We don't have to create jobs. We don't do this and that. Um, so it feels uh, very decoupled. If, if we figure out uh, there's an unresolved package, we send the message to Kafka and we handle it later on. Uh, same for the uh, package update stop the stuff uh, that uh, Kevin is doing. If we figure out uh, somebody has deleted and release from the Python index, we send that message to Kafka and handle it later. So um, f feels like a good uh, addition to to our technology repository or repertoire. Our, um, I think uh, Kevin and you might be the ones with the most experience uh, on Faust, which is uh, the Python framework no, we use. That is just Kevin. Oh, very good. Uh, I need to make a note on that one. Um, <laughs> so it's just Kevin having all the knowledge um, on, on Faust, the Python framework that we are using to talk to Kafka. And um, yeah, as I said, I think it's a good addition to the Tosser architecture to have these uh, asynchronous decoupled um, components. Cool. Any other questions? We have 16 minutes. So what we got on our list? Fridolin, can you limit yes. it to six minutes? Yes, of course. But I'm not sure if I will put it in six minutes, but I will try. <laughs> so, thanks, Frido, for letting me, let me go ahead. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my demo will be about a new library that is called Fext. You can find it in our organization. And uh, this library is written in C++ with C bindings to, to Python. So we use it uh, in C Python. And basically this library is an uh, implementation of a minhipq that is optimized for removing uh, uh, items or values from, from uh, the heap. So values that are stored in the heap are optimized for removals. And uh, that is one of the main ideas how we optimized our, our advisor. So this library is used in, uh, in advisor. Uh, in the readme file, you can find how to build uh, this C Python extension and how to release it on PyPI. And what I will show you now, I will show you uh, two advisor implementations. So uh, one, uh, the very first one will not use this uh, library. And uh, I will try to uh, resolve uh, stacks that have solely Flask in any version. So when I run uh, advisor, I limit a uh, number of software stacks that are uh, produced to 150,000. Uh, I give it some seed uh, for reproducibility. So uh, the next advisor run will have the same seed, so it will produce the same errors, uh, or not errors, but results. And now I run advisor, and it starts to produce uh, software stacks and score them. Uh, it produces it based on the latest predictor, so uh, we are trying to find uh, latest software stacks first. So as you can see, uh, right now we have uh, something like 200, uh, 2,300 stacks, stacks a second. So uh, advisor should finish in few uh, few seconds. Uh, once we reach uh, desired 150,000. Uh, so as you can see, it takes some time. And what can you also observe is that after some point in time, the speed of advisor is decreasing. 
This is due to the fact that we have more and more internal states uh, inside uh, advisor and the data structure that is internally keeping states of, of, uh, of uh, resolver is not uh, optimal and cannot uh, serve its, its purpose well. So we spend a lot of time on reorganizing uh, internal data structures and we don't spend much time on actual resolution and on actual uh, resolving. So once the advisor finishes, it should be very first. Uh, you can see that it finished in one minute, 30 seconds. And uh, when I switch to master branch, uh, I will run the same advisor with the same seed, with the same uh, limit uh, to number of stacks that should be uh, produced. So basically the same uh, run. And uh, what we should see besides messages on our uh, channel, uh, you should see that uh, advisor is uh, faster. So previously uh, advisor finished in one with 1 1.7 uh, thousand stacks per second. And now advisor is able to uh, resolve uh, this software stack faster and uh, uh, score them uh, faster. So that means uh, that we can uh, first uh, produce uh, results faster, but it also means that uh, we have optimal structure for for the reinforcement learning part of advisor, so we can uh, invest more time into learning how software stacks should be resolved, and we don't spend uh, that much time on uh, actual uh, resolution uh, in the advisor's resolver. So as you can see, when I compare results, uh, the optimized version something like 4.4 thousand stacks per second, and not optimized uh, version had 1.7 stacks per second for a single uh, for a simple flask stack uh, with any version restrictions. So that would be it. Do you have any questions? All of the improvements are just because you're using bindings and not the uh, default Python data structures? Uh, so um, uh, the implementation of FEX, the library, uh, is optimized in a way that uh, normally when you have a minhip queue and you try to remove uh, some element from that minhip queue, it takes uh, 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 and multiplied by uh, log n time to uh, remove uh, the element from, from the queue. But uh, with this optimized version, it's uh, in linear time. And uh, it's because of uh, the hash table. So we hash uh, and keep track of indices to, to the heap queue. So the more states we have, uh, the the time needed for removal of an element uh, increases uh, logarithmically and not uh, linearly. So that's the main element for optimization. Any other questions? Okay, I hope I made it in six minutes. Thanks. Yes, it was the perfect six minutes. Um, that's uh, good. Uh, no, okay. Joking aside, uh, so Dominic, either you're going to make it in about another six minutes, or we're going to postpone it for the next uh, session. What What do you want to do? First, unmute yourself, then start talking. Or I'm going to help you unmute. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm going to make it in six, six minutes, I guess. Cool. Then oh. go ahead, please. Okay. So, um, what I showed last time was um, uh, proof of concept in Jupyter Notebooks uh, in visualization of the project health status uh and right right now with it uh 
local visualization using a, a Dash application. And uh, the idea behind it is uh, to have, because, because we, we right now have a, a local analysis of the, of the, uh, of any repository. That means that you store knowledge on your device or you can do remote analysis and the knowledge would be stored on Zev. So, and the idea is that you should be also able to uh, to visualize uh, information locally. And I de I've decided to use a dash, and it it should be the proof of concept that we can see that it is useful. And we decide to use it also remotely using superset or something else. And uh, yes, so I will run the dash and. When and anybody run the anybody can run the application, the Dash application, and it uh, runs, of course, locally. And it's some kind of a web page report. So now you have a more clean, structured way of seeing the health status of the project. I've also added uh, analysis uh, to inspect the current opened entities like current active issues or pull requests. Uh, we only analyzed the closed ones uh, before, but I think that in order to fully see what's going on in your repository, you want to also see like the, the current closed ones and the current, current active ones. So uh, you, you can wonder what is this slider? <laughs> I didn't quite have a time to complete it, but uh, it is nearly completed, and that should be used for uh, configuration of how much uh, uh, progress you want to see in the report. So you can choose, like, I want to see a health report that that uh, shows me the recent week or recent month or maybe recent year. So I think that that would be really useful for you. <clears throat> But if we decide we don't want it, I, I can remove it anytime. Uh, also, I've added a, a graph that shows you um, activity of contributors, meaning that you have a score points and I've just used a sim simplest. Is it just my audio or is it for everybody? Um, I can't hear. Yes. Dominic, come back, unmute yourself. You are unmuted. Hmm. Dominic, can you hear us? Time inspection. Yes, can you hear me? Mm, kind of. I think we lost you a minute ago. Oh, heck. <laughs> so keep on going from that uh, time start. What is MTTCI? Yes, yes. Okay, so time stats, uh, the MTTCI, uh, th these were the visualizations shown in Jupyter Showcase. So it is a mean time to close an issue and mean time to review. And uh, actually, you can uh, inspect the time uh, timeline here in Dash or Potli here. But can you reshare your screen, please? Sorry for interrupting. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. And uh, you could do you could do the time inspection here in Plotly using Dash, but this doesn't apply to like things like top five active contributors when you see currently the overall stats. But you 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 probably want to see just the weak stats, uh, like the recent week closed issues or opened issues and etc. And I've and right here <clears throat> we had a, a contributor analysis in Jupyter notebooks. And uh, the the idea was that you have focused on one contributor and and to and you have displayed the stats for that one contributor. So I've added the <clears throat> possibility to choose which contributor you want to analyze. 
So, for example, here we can uh, see a Dirk, Dirk Fry's analysis, and basically it's just just a thing, just the visualizations before, and I can choose anybody else, and uh, it changes uh, lively. So, yeah. Um, some questions? Nice. So this is uh, the visualization of the data that you have on your disk done by an yeah. Python application server serving this HTML page, right? Yeah, and the and, uh, this data is processed. So uh, our pipeline is like to analyze uh, issues and pull requests, then to process that pre-process the information and also store it on Zeph. And by that, you will achieve that the report will be generated only once and not each time you, you want to view it. Cool. So the next step should be to, to have an Argo workflow, which is uh, continuously doing that, right? Aggregating new data, analyzing, and so on. Yeah, yeah. right now we have a cron job that, uh, uh, anal that, do, uh, and that does analysis of uh, of just the issues and pull requests, I uh, I can add the pre-processing thing to that, and yeah. Cool. Nice. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> Okay, no, I hope I, that's good. I did it in six minutes. <laughs> yes, you also had the perfect six minutes. That's uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so in my time zone, it's uh, five o'clock. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the demos. Um, I'm going to cut all that stuff into um, uh, YouTube chunks and uh, publish uh, the show notes uh, too. Um, feel free to join the AICUE weekly no, monthly webcast. Uh, Francesco going to talk about something and I think somebody else. See you over there. Thanks for the time and the demos. Bye. Recording has stopped.